I believe in the Hustler Nation and I believe in its power and I'm actually a member of the Hustler Nation. If a chicken seller like William Ruto can become president, then the Hustler Nation is a secret to be discovered. On Friday, April 17th, I came across a missed call from a number I did not recognize. Shortly, this was followed by a text message from Professor Mutahinguni, who introduced himself and requested me to appear on Punchline, a show hosted by Ms. Anne Kiguta on K24 television. I agreed to honor the invitation, given that the show suggested a topic was topical and I thought worth my time. It has since become clear that this was a ploy to anchor a desperate, contradictory, misinformed and ill-advised message grafted by Nguni at the behest of his masters with Anki Guta providing a voice. The manner in which my participation was exploited without my notice or consent in this unethical and lowly charade has constrained me to offer this rejoinder in order to clear the misunderstandings and provide the context. The authors of Kiguta's recital struggled heavily to emphasize the fact that His Excellency Uhuru Kenyatta is the president. I do not know who just discovered this seemingly exciting fact or who they think needs to be told because as far as all Kenyans are concerned, Uhuru Kenyatta has been president for eight years now. No one is more aware of this fact than the apparent target of this recital. That is the, de the Kenyatta's deputy, Honorable William Ruto. This is the one politician who has actively supported Kenyatta's presidential ambitions at great cost over a period of 20 years, three elections and one electoral defeat. Why then would someone in their right senses go to town with this declaration as though it was breaking news? Secondly, this narration through Kiguta on behalf of whoever stated that President Kenyatta has ditched his deputy. Now, we cannot tell you why exactly this covenant fell apart. For whatever reason, President Kenyatta has chosen a new political ally in Raila Odinga. Perhaps politically, according to him, the DP could only have gotten him so far, but governing for the last term required another alliance. The effort invested to make this superfluous point is ridiculous. Only a fool doesn't know all this. In fact, no one, no, no one knows this fact better than Jubilee's 8 million members. We know it because there has been no party meeting at any level or any time this time. No parliamentary group meeting, no national executive council meeting, and no national govern governing council meeting. But the irrelevance of this strenuous assertion is born out of by plain facts. When Kenyatta came together with Ruto to contest the 2013 election, they had an agreement. The agreement was for Ruto to support Kenyatta in his bid to win the presidential election, and Ruto agreed to support Kenyatta unconditionally. There was no reciprocal agreement or commitment for Kenyatta to support Ruto in the future. Afterwards, Kenyatta, without any prodding, without any pressure or coercion, proceeded to enter a covenant with Jubilee supporters before Kenyans where he undertook to serve for a full term and thereafter support Ruto to serve a subsequent term. His emphatic and repeated declaration in his own words, kumi yangu, kumi ya Ruto. Wagoje miaka kumi, uhuru amalize kazi yake, alafu wagoje miaka ingine kumi, Ruto amalize kazi yake, this covenant was publicly confessed on numerous occasions. Mimi majaliwa ya Mwenyezi Mungu si tukirudi si ni miaka mitano. Si nitaenda nyumbani. Si mimi nimesema nitaunga mkono wa ndugu yangu Mheshimiwa Ruto. Eh. Muzi si yeye atakuja na timu yake ile atakuja naye. Si mimi nitawaunga mkono. Na sisi tunataka tuungane. Mimi niende ni malize awamu yangu ya pili tarehe nane mwezi ujao kutoka hapo tuungane tupangie William moja Ruto moja sio mbili There is no instant recorded documented or even merely remembered when Ruto mentioned or alluded to an arrangement of this nature 
which remained purely a matter of Kenyatta's unilateral covenant. It is also was the basis of the subsequent proclamations of a 20-year jubilee leadership and a post-2032 message. Yeah. Kijana hawachi mzee, mzee ndiyo anawachia kijana. Yeah. Saa zili tutakuwa, eh, eh, mimi ndiyo mzee kidogo kuliko ruto, mimi malize ni muachie ruto ya endele, eh, eh, malize awachie, eh, awe mzee awachie mwingine, lakini hatuwezi kurudi huko mbele ya tituachie mzee. Inaweze kane kweli? Ha, na mna gani njini buwana? Muna taka tupoteze, muna taka tupoteze barabara? Eh? Hapana. The Kiguta and Gunyi script suggests that Ruto still conducts himself as though he is totally unaware that he has been shortchanged. Now, in reporting these events that have followed, we have often debated why the DP has stayed where he is clearly not wanted. Why face the humiliation? Why insist that all is well when it clearly isn't? Why try to paint an image of togetherness where really there is none? How does it benefit the deputy president or those who support him? What is there to protect? He is aware. He is acutely aware, and so are we all. Only that he is a gentleman and as such has refused to conform to the desires and expectations of the Kiguta masters who have labored strenuously to provoke and force him to behave in a certain way. After all, that has happened. These brokers and busybodies are, are, are the ones left, announcing to the world that no, mini no minister speaks to Ruto, that the security services ignore him, and that he has been evicted from his official residence in Mombasa. They go on to say that his cabinet roles have been transferred to a minister through an executive order. The same busybodies say that even during national crisis, mourning or emergencies, meetings of the National Security Council, where he is constitutionally mandated to attend, are held without him. After flooding the media with all these attacks, ridicule and innuendo, one would have to be monumentally naive to imagine that Ruto is unaware of his betrayal, a man who has kept Kenyatta's presidential ambitions alive for two decades, and who, in his own right, is a phenomenally successful politician. Surely, he cannot have any difficulty interpreting these simple clues. A key justification for all this mistreatment meant to Ruto is that he started to campaign for 2022 early. Even assuming that this is the is a crime. What about the impunity and the be and becoming shenanigans at the Jubilee party? What about Kieleweke? In fact, the 2022 campaign was started by a senior party official, David Murade, who began to roll out the Stop Ruta campaign to complement Kieleweke. Mm -hmm. Going forward, the Stop Ruta movement which we are going to start, there is nothing, uh, no stopping it. Mm -hmm. So let them assemble their troops, we will assemble ours, and you will see them very soon. There is going to be a vice chair of Jubilee, all right? I'm out, okay? There is going to be formations. This was before coalescing with ODM to build the BBI anti-Ruto campaign on a balance of probabilities. Has Ruto really sinned or has he been sinned against? Kiguta Nguni suggested that Ruto ought to embrace the example of David, of scripture. And in making our final observation, and because it is Sunday, we will even paint pictures from scripture and consider the example of a shepherd boy named David who would ultimately become king. Now, not even David's own father thought him worthy enough of leadership, and his predecessor, King Saul, made life hell for David. But because leadership was his, David became king in spite of it, not by fighting Saul, but by trusting that what was his, was his. This analogy is deeply disturbing because if it suggests that Ruto is David, who is staying where he is clearly not wanted and facing humiliation, then the authors of the script mean Kenyatta must be Saul. Now Saul was anointed to be king of Israel. But after reneging on a covenant, he fell out of God's favor. As a result, Saul devolved into a spiteful, vindictive, and bitter and blindly malevolent character who did all he could, not just to thwart David, 
but to murder him. It must be remembered that although David had multiple opportunities to harm Saul, he always rejected them, opting instead to patiently endure whatever Saul mentored out. Why would Kiguta liken the president to this tragic biblical figure? When did President Uhuru become King Saul? This is simply bizarre. Kiguta and Gunyi also strongly maintain that humiliation and persecution of uh, Ruto is similar to what President Moy underwent as Vice President to Mzejo Mokenyata. Or let us use even a more recent example. What of the late President Daniel Torotich Arab Moy? Moy, as a Vice President, suffered terrible humiliation at the hands of Mze Kenyatta's handlers. Why is it necessary or important for a President to harass, humiliate, frustrate he, and his deputy? What sort of leadership seeks gratification from this malicious behavior? And since when did it become the standard operating procedure of government? And again, this is not about whether the boss is right or wrong or anything like that. It's about the fact that the boss is the boss. If Kiguta and Gunyi say that Kenyatta deliberately broke a covenant he unilaterally and voluntarily entered. President Kenyatta has decided against his deputy. Choose whichever reason you want for this. But what you cannot choose is that that is the bottom line. Now, President Kenyatta is out of the marriage or covenant and it appears that he is out for good. Why does he require brokers and busybodies like Murade and Francis Atuoli to propagate the breach? Kiguta and Gunyi go on to say, that whether Kenyatta's actions are right or wrong, moral or not, is relevant because it is all politics and politics is a game. We are not saying that this is good or bad or moral or not. We are neither applauding this move or booing it. We are simply observing it and stating things as they are. Uhuru Kenyatta is the president of Kenya. The caliber of a leader is measured by the extent to which their word is their bond. If Kiguta and Gunyi are suggesting Kenyatta conned Jubilee supporters and that he actually should change his deputy, are they saying also that it is acceptable for the president of Kenya to be deceitful and immoral? Kenyatta and Ruto to go together to rid Kenya of the politics of deceit, conmanship, fraud and ethnic nationalism and, and betrayal. If according to Kiguta this is normal, does it mean that deceit Fraud and betrayal are Kenyatta's governing principles, really? What does that pretend for the Jubilee Manifesto, commitments and other covenants that he makes, including his pet project, The Handshake, BBI, and his new friend, Raila Odinga? Finally, Kiguta and Gunyi exert themselves at great length to say that the Jubilee Party was not a formal institution, but a function of the personalities of Kenyatta and Ruto. The heart of Jubilee, the core of it, was not party structures and organs and a party constitution. No. What made Jubilee a force in politics was the partnership, the marriage, the cooperation of President Kenyatta and his deputy. And without the president, there is no Jubilee in real terms. But we must recognize that it is not the individual that is important, it's the team. I said last time, and I wish to repeat again today, we shall be holding regular parliamentary group meetings. And in those parliamentary group meetings, honorable members, I want to give you my personal assurance that you will be free to raise whatever issue that is on your mind, even if it means disagreement with the leadership. Yeah? All right? You'll be completely free. Let us have vibrant internal democracy so that we can get the best. You know, but within our parliamentary group, kila moja wenu ajue atakuwa na uhuru wa kusema ile iko ndani ya roho yake. Kenyatta himself was clear that the party must transcend individuals and exist for future generations. The configuration of Jubilee is deliberately against individualism or disguised ethnic nationalism. This is why it, was, it transformed itself into a national party guided by set ideals and values. We are here as a Jubilee family 
to proclaim the meaning of our party. The party that we launch here today is an expression of our unity, our oneness, and our togetherness. The idea that the president can casually trample a party constitution he participated in writing is problematic as far as respect for the institution goes. If the president can violate a party constitution, how do we expect him to respect the constitution of Kenya? Gunya and Kiguta also told us that the president is going to form a new grand coalition with opposition leaders. Murabe has often said that they can leave the party to Ruto and form another. And that is a real likelihood, a super lineup of some five or six like-minded politicians representing the country is on the horizon with the same kind of branding and catchy jingles and those terrible pictures of politicians kissing babies. You have mentioned the Baba here. People can expect new formations in the future. We can move on to a bigger house, which will be bigger than Jubilee. What business, then, does a retiring president have in forming ragtag coalitions with the opposition and political brokers? Ruto is not ashamed of his past. He is not ashamed of his past as a chicken seller, as a hustler, and as a KYM. In fact, he carries these labels of shame on his shoulder with pride. And because of this, he will walk into the presidency as a former chicken seller, and he'll represent our aspirations as a nation of hustlers with pride. His symbols of struggle are powerful, in my view. They give us hope. They instruct us not to be ashamed of who we are. If your father had no name, like William Ruto's dad, you can beat the odds and become president. <laughs>